All right. So for anyone who does not know me, my name is Brandon. I am the campaign coordinator for Cool Davis, and I'll be hosting uh, the Steven meeting. Nice to have you all here. Um, how about we do some introductions for the people that are uh, new to this meeting? A few, few new faces, I see. Um, but yeah, I'm Brandon, I'm the campaign coordinator. You can always reach out to me if you want to get involved okay. in some uh, Diva events or have any questions about Cool Davids, just uh, send me an email. Hi, I'm Brian Ayo. Hey, Brian. Good to have you here. Uh, my name is Zach O'Donnell. I'm, this is my second meeting, so still learning, but I'm glad to be here. Great. Thank you, Zach. Good to have you. Hi, I'm Jerry Pohorsky. I'm uh, down here in Santa Clara. I'm president of the Silicon Valley Electric Vehicle Association. I've been coming for a couple of years on and off, but um, you're new to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was brought on. Uh, I was brought on second half of last year. Okay. But yeah, it's nice to have people from um, all around California. It's great. Thanks. Hi, it's Rich Bradley, and uh, I'm. This is about my, my second or third meeting. I'm here in Davis. Hey, Rich. Good to see you again. We're Barbara and Robert. Um, uh, long time members of DIVA, maybe founding, uh, mm -hmm. they're from the founding. And um, it's great to see you all. Today, I was fondly thinking about the in-person meetings that we used to have, where we would uh, have pizza and drinks while we talked to each sure. other. And uh, yeah, Peter remembers those days. Uh, so uh, let's bring those back. Let's figure out a way to meet in person. Indeed. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, I'm uh, Peter Mackin. I'm <clears throat> president of the Sacramento Electric Vehicle Association. Just uh, right down the highway from you guys. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of lost count of how many meetings I've been to. I ran out of fingers and toes, so I don't know. It's more than 20. <laughs> um, so, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Short. Rich Casillas here. Uh, I've been uh, attending a few meetings myself. Uh, I'm Davis-based, uh, and I learn a lot when I come to these meetings and and it's great to see uh, a good participation. So thank you. And I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off my video so that I can also keep working while I'm right. while I'm listening. But thank you. Hello, I'll go next. I'm Bob from Vacaville, and I'm also a member of the Saki V group, and I'm planning on joining uh, uh, Cool Davis for the picnic day. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a big day. What else? Who else hasn't uh, given oh. a Hi, I'm uh, Fabrizio Saracini. I'm here in uh, Woodland, and uh, I have been uh, attending a few of the meetings for both the Diva and SAC EV. Um, I am always open to uh, have my roadster uh, at, at any of the EV events. I've signed up for both the the Earth Day, Earth Month event at uh, in Sacramento, and the Davis uh, Parade Day. 
Well, looking forward to uh, both events. Uh, I'll have a busy weekend. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a fun weekend, though. Yes. For those who don't know, um, uh, I'll talk about this in a bit as well. Picnic Day is a, it's, it's a once a year event in Davis where a marching band goes and all, all the community get, get together for different activities um, throughout like the downtown area and the college. All right, and then we have Eric Ide here. Um, he says he is a bit under the weather, so I'll I'll spare him the uh, the burden of having to speak through that. <laughs> Sorry, pick me up next time. It's all right. No worries. Totally understandable. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone again for arriving. Um, we were planning on doing a meeting in person for this for this month's uh, meeting, but unfortunately we couldn't get a get the venue. Um, but we are planning. I'm sure you saw the last uh, the last communication that we are planning on having an in-person meeting at the next um, at the next event, the, the, the next April meeting, if not the following one, which will be in two months from now. So June. So look forward to that. Um, we also want to have people from Valley Clean Energy to come and discuss things, uh, different programs that may involve like EV charging and stuff like that, as well as maybe some academics that do uh, research on subjects related to EVs. So all those kinds of things are uh, in the works. So this meeting is mostly going to be um, about picnic day and any discussion that we might have, any announcements that anyone would like to make, please feel free. Um, yeah. I will say that um, you probably all have been seeing the communications that um, the 20th of this month is going to be picnic day. Cool Davis is helping put together two events. It's the picnic day parade. Um, and there's the Cool Davis section and there's the Diva section for that. And there's also a um, Institute of Transportation Studies exhibit that, it, that Cool Davis is helping put together at the Alumni Center that day from 10 to four. Um, so we're going to have students, grad students from that institute uh, presenting some of their probably recent uh, research, people from Diva showcasing their, their vehicles. So if you participate in that, uh, get you signed up. If not, feel free to stop by. It's gonna be happening until 4 p.m. on, on Saturday um, next week. Um, also, the parade is a lot of fun too. It's always a, a huge, um, huge attraction for, for everyone as well. So yeah, it looks like Johan's joined us as well. That's great. <clears throat> so are there any questions about picnic day that people may want to ask right now? Yes, Brandon, should we just go through? I'm going through Nathan. Is that still just fill out the paperwork and proof of insurance? Uh, if you would like to do the parade, send that, send the group waiver and the insurance to me, uh, for the okay. ITS, yeah, for the ITS exhibit, you won't need uh, a waiver or, or proof of insurance. This is just for okay. the parade. We'll need those. Yeah. But if you would like right. to hear more about the ITS exhibit, like their email, yeah, you can just email diva at cooldavis.org. And um, Nathan can check that out. And I'm always here to, to answer questions as well with their email. <clears throat> okay, yeah, thanks. Of course. Yeah, the parade uh, kickoff is at 915. Um, but we would like people there, or the, for the picking day parade people would like people there um, no later than, I think, 8, 8 a.m. because of all the staging that's going to be happening beforehand. 
Okay. And the uh, staging area will be in the information that I get from you yeah. guys, right? Yeah, we're going to be, yeah, we'll let you know um, where you'll need to be um, the week, okay. at least one week beforehand. It's going to be off okay. of Russell on either California or Howard, I think, one of those two streets. Um, okay. So, yeah, basically morning gov, you just, you know, you pull in, drive slow, and and find your group, you know. Uh, but, yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, yeah we'll, we'll have more information, so look forward to that. Good deal. Yeah, and we can stay in touch that day, so. Definitely. Yeah, I, I just came back um, yesterday. I came back from a, an orientation meeting for, for picnic day, so and there was a lot of people there, so I expect it to be a pretty busy day. Fun day, though. Yeah. It usually is. Yeah. Yeah, usually is. Okay, thank you. Of course. Any other questions? And anyone have any anything they'd like to say? Any announcements? Um, this is Zach. I have um something to bring up and you kind of mentioned it when you talked about um the agenda for the next meeting so this may be something you already know about but i'm going to mention it i was uh charging my car the other day and i met a couple of uh students from uc davis of the electric vehicle research center in the engineering department oh that's cool. um so i don't know if you guys have been in touch with them or, or not in the past does that ring a bell um i don't think i've communicated with them um for this upcoming meeting, one of my uh, fellow staff members might have, uh, but I, I I would have heard about it. You said they were from what from what department? The, what they're with the engineering department, but they're part of uh, Electric Vehicle Research Center, EVRC. Okay. And they were uh, collecting. They collect data on. They study different things and collect data to try to understand the EV market, but they seem to have um, quite a bit of knowledge about uh, trends, okay. uh, problems that are coming up in the future, things that people have mentioned the, the, in the other meeting I went to, little bits about um, changes in the laws and how it's going to affect EVs, uh, sales, oh, resale, that, things like that. That um, seems very they, relevant, yeah. But a thing that was really interesting, they had uh, – created a device that would attach to the uh, cable that goes between the charging station and your car where they can um, glean data, the handshake data between the two um, machines, your car and the charger, and uh, monitor how they're talking to each other and what they're doing. So they're collecting data for that. I thought that was fat. They go up to you and they ask you, can I attach this to your cable and blah, blah, blah. It's anonymous. And anyway, it was and then they collect it on their computer and then they go away and I don't know yeah, no, what they do with it. But it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, they pr probably have something a little bit more, uh, uh, something of interest to us that's not so technical as collecting handshake data between two machines. But hey, you never know. So, um, so but, they see, but they were very, uh, anyway, I got an email from them. And I have some contacts, so if you are interested, I can send you some of that uh, information and um, to try to reach out, or I can reach out and get back to you. I don't know how you guys work this. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind uh, connecting the two of us, and then I can I can take it from there. Um, okay. I put my email in the group chat. So please uh, send that my way. That sounds actually um, like a very interesting topic for the next meeting. And I'm going to mention this at the last meeting I went to. I mentioned this. And I'm going to continue to mention it until I, I'm, I am interested in learning or um, exploring more options for charging, public charging in Davis and the surrounding area for the growth of electric vehicles. Um, so, but it, it didn't seem like there were a lot of, a lot of interest in the from people before because everyone thought uh, people had a charging station in their house which mm -hmm. most people in davis don't live in a house they live in an apartment 
and they bring their electric cars to Davis and then they clog up charging stations because there aren't enough um, because we're in a college town. It's just the way it is. So yeah. um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there and, and um, hope that we might. And I don't know if the city of Davis uh, promotes those kinds of things because they used to promote getting cell towers. So do they promote getting um charging stations in town do they do we even know uh well i'll say that um between charging stations within davis um there is a divide between uc davis and the city um oh what a surprise yeah <laughs> well you know it's uh, all, it all has to do with funding right so uh i can say that uh there are there are transportation uh factions groups that w within the college that are currently pursuing grants for uh, for updated charging stations within their parking lots and around the campus. So there are there's definitely an an effort uh, going on to to get those charging stations updated. Because um, I yeah I would say that right now it's not it's not as feasible at, as it could be to own an ele own an ele electric vehicle. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up, Zach. Yeah, and and uh, I would want to add, getting back to that uh, uh, sniffing data out of the charging cord, mm -hmm. that just tells you that the SAE did a crappy job of shielding the communication wires. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. I don't know what they're gaining from it, but you know, whatever. <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, interesting. I'm sure they do something more that's more uh, down to, you know, something a little bit closer to a home that we might be able to um, learn something from than that. Though, hey, they, they seem to have a lot of information about trends, the future. They seem to be studying a lot of different angles that I think this group would be interested in. That's why, uh, you know, they were all over the map. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they'll have some good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great, I'll, I'll uh, make that connection and uh, pass it on. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Zach. Okay. Um, uh, so, Johans, you, you've had your hand up. Uh, yeah, hi. So um, hi, everyone. I'm not a frequent visitor to the EB um, users group, but I just appropriated a Bolt for our family. So I'm thoroughly enjoying driving it, and we hardly use our gas-powered car now. It's just most of our travel is within 50 to 60 miles of Davis and you don't need it. You just don't need the gas. Um, it's pretty yes. amazing, but you all know that already. So I'm I'm sort of new to it. Yes. But I did want to say, the reason I raised my hand is that uh, Cool Davis uh, managed to work with the city. One of the things that we've done is we work, I'm on the board, by the way, of full disclosure. Um, and um, one of the things that we did a number of years ago, you may have remembered, uh, those who've been here for a while, the SACOG grant that came to Davis to put charging stations in in various locations around Davis and Woodland. And uh, it was a three, I believe it was a $3 million grant, if I'm not mistaken. And I can't remember the exact number of charging stations, public charging stations that they uh, funded for the city, uh, for West Sac, for Woodland. Uh, I think those are the three recipients, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but um, so there is some interest by the city in looking at this. Uh, I'm also a member of the Planning Commission, and I know that as a member of the Planning Commission, we're very, very interested, first of all, in trying to make sure that we don't have a lot of homes that need um, that we're pushing public transportation. But for those that do have need to use cars, we're asking builders to put to charging stations into their new units. So uh, that's part of an ongoing process with the city right now. Um, and if I, if you want more data on that and what's been happening, what particular ordinances have been passed, perhaps I can bring that back to the next meeting if that would interest people. Um, is that of interest to you or is that just too esoteric to have any meaning for what you do here? I don't think that that's irrelevant at all. I think that's actually something that people would be interested in hearing about. No. Yeah. Well, okay. Great. 
Yeah, I, I'd be happy to to um, to let you know what the city ordinances currently say and the direction that some of the city council members would like to see um, our builders, uh, in the, especially as you all know, there's about 3,000 homes that are come, going to come in uh, along the Mace Curve. That's going to be huge and a big game changer for the city. But, um, you know, looking to see that those that that build out has the appropriate number of charging stations, I think would be really important for those residents moving in there. And since it's all new, um, there's no new infrastructure that has to be put in. It's all new infrastructure. <laughs> so anyway, I'll get back to you. I won't waste any more of your time and I'll bring that information back to your next meeting. Oh, well, thanks, Johans. You're, you're not wasting our time at all. This is what this meeting's for. But yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I think it'll be interesting East, to kind of get a look at, you know, what the city's planning for something like uh, something of that scale. Yeah, and, and uh, I think it works with what Zach was saying, too. You know, like, how do we coordinate? You know, one of the things that always frustrates me and probably all of you is we all have these silos that we work in. And, you know, one side doesn't necessarily know what the other side is doing. And, you know, they want your data, but when they won't give you their data. And then these yeah. crazy games that we all play to, you know, that's going to, that will shorten the life of the planet if we don't get that under control really fast. But uh, that's another issue. Anyway, um, it'd be nice to see if uh, in your work, Brandon, with them, if you follow up, ask them if they know about SACOG and what SACOG is doing and what's going on regionally outside of UC Davis and see what they know. And we'll try and figure out if they missed anything that we know and we can present everything next meeting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That sounds good. Thank you. All right, Mauricio, the floor is yours. Yeah. I have a question for, for Johan. We, the, the process, the project that you refer to are for new homes that are going to be presumably owner occupied. Or if they're going to be rental, they'll still have uh, the capability of uh, of having a two, a, a charging port or, a, or an electrical outlet in the garage. Like I I moved here uh, three years ago, new home construction. I have a two forty outlet in my garage already. Came with the house. Yep. But people who don't own their home, they they're renting, and it's an older home. What is there to incentivize? those homeowners to install even just a 240, a level two outlet to help uh, move uh, renters to buy electric vehicles. But one of the things I do when I go to and display my car is to talk about ownership of EVs. And that's one of the complaints that I hear is that mm -hmm. people who rent don't have the capability because their homeowners don't have, don't are not willing to put in a, a, a charging port or a charging uh, level two outlet? Well, you're raising an interesting question. And I, I know uh, this is uh, something that uh, Brandon can can maybe talk to at another time, but Cool Davis is really focusing, as you, you may know this statistic, but I believe anywhere from, you see this 43% or 47% of the people, everybody living in Davis, there's only 43% of the people own their homes in Davis. The rest are rental units. That's a surprise. Uh, people know that. Is that something you've seen also in the recent statistics? Uh, yeah. So, so the bottom line on that is how do we bring them to the table, especially units that have been around for a while and people have probably done fairly well and are they willing to reinvest? And that's a whole area that, is part of our new strategic plan is to begin to work with renters specifically around issues just like this. And I think it's going to be really important to bring the managers, the apartment managers, and the residential managers of these properties and their uh, owners who often don't live in Davis, you know, to the table to discuss what can be done. Because if you look at it from one side, if they can work with put a charging station in and get a cut of what whoever charges for the electricity that's provided through that, it's a moneymaker for them. I mean, they get, they'll recoup the cost of putting in a charging station, uh, you know, a level two charging station fairly quickly, I would guess. 
Um, but, you know, I don't know. But that's stuff that, that I know our board is really concerned about. And we're not only looking at that for Davis, but we're looking at that for other places in the county where we hope to be doing some additional work uh, outside of Davis. So um, maybe we can report on that. Brandon, maybe that's something we could also report on in terms of um, you know, what our direction is in that at this point. It still may be formulative, you know, it's still be in the formation stages, but I know we as a board have talked about that um, as a concern. So um, I'm not sure what's happening right now, but it's on our radar, definitely. I know that as a, I have a, uh, I own a rental property in Arizona, and I know that uh, if I make improvements to the house, if I do maintenance to the house, that I can deduct that uh, from my from my taxes. It's a business expense, and but I don't know how many other homeowners who have rental properties are aware that they could get an incentive, they could take that off their taxes. That that would be considered. A business expense, or perhaps there are state incentives or other incentives that would that could defray that cost initially as well. That's kind of the, the direction that I'm thinking is is are there programs like that to incentivize these uh, rental property owners from install to install a even a, just a 240 outlet? Yeah. Are there, are there any other people on the call now that? Um that are either renters or and if so where do you go to charge your your ev if you are if you have any renting at this point what 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 are your solutions to this well <clears throat> i have some thoughts but i'm not a renter um so what i was going to say is number one you guys should talk to guy hall um with SAC EV because he's on a group called the uh, EV Charging for All Coalition, I think it is. Anyway, they've been working for years with the um, standards development group. I don't know what their proper name is for the state, trying to get the codes changed to require um, EV uh, charging you know, capability in new homes and in um, apartments, uh, MUDs, so apartments, condos. Um, one thing that I didn't realize, but it's actually true, is the code does not require an outlet in a garage. All it requires is that the garage be EV ready, which means there has to be a conduit and a box but there doesn't have to be an actual circuit or an outlet. Now, most builders go ahead and put the outlet in because, you know, as Fabrizio said, he's got one. And um, so, so that's, that's good. But the actual code does not require an outlet, even now in a single family home. Seems pretty short-sighted. Yeah, very. Yeah. Given, given how cheap it is, especially when you're building the house and the sheetrock isn't even in the garage. Yeah, exactly. it's like, you know, it's pennies. Well, more than pennies, but very cheap. But the other thing is, you know, outdoor, you know, a lot of places just have uh, overheads. They don't have garages, you know, particularly for renters. You know, you have an apartment. Why can't they put a bank of those in there? Uh, you know, um, and again, it, it, I would think not only would they get a deduction, but uh, it, it'd be great to oh. talk to landlords who have done it and can say, we make money off of this because that's yeah. what incentivizes them. You know, it's like, yeah, it, it, yes, that's true. But then, you know, we've also been advocating uh, at SAC EV anyway uh, for equity. And mm -hmm. if you start charging extra for the electricity to charge an EV, that's no longer equitable because the people in single family homes get their EV juice for about half price. And, you know, so people that are lower income and live in apartments or condos, well, not all low income people live in apartments or condos, but, you know, those um, individuals, they're paying, you know, twice as much basically for the for the same product. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't seem fair. So, um, but you're right, if the that is an incentive for the for the property manager, the property owner to put in um, an EV charger. Now, one thing that I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think I'm right, is that in California, I believe there's a law that requires the property owner if, of a rental property to allow the renter 
to install an EVSE at their own expense um, if they want to put it in. Now, obviously, that means the renters pay in the full freight for the installation, but then they get the elect you know they get the electricity at the discount because they can get a discounted rate from Smut or PG E or whoever. So um, that that may be another option. Um, you know, so if we could figure out a way to get incentives to the renters so that they could then afford to have those um, EVSE installed in a garage, even though they're a renter, that would probably help too. Hmm. But the, the, something tells me somebody's looked at this before and looked at the very, you know, I, I mean, so I'm wondering if yeah. that you UC Davis area knows very much about any of these items that we're talking about now or... I, I would think they do but i mean I, I just don't know for sure I, and like i said i'm i am far from an expert at this so so guy hall knows probably 10 times what i know uh as it relates to codes and stuff so um you know it might be good uh if you're planning to have like a diva meeting dedicated to ev charging installations etc uh maybe talk to him get some input because i'm sure he can provide you a lot of good information yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Do, do you have his um, contact info? I can put it in the chat if you need it. Put it, put it in the chat and then okay. uh, I can pull up with Brandon afterwards and um, okay. and see where we can go with all of this. I, I have okay. a feeling we're there are others who know about this. The question is finding them and then being able to report back on what the range is. And again, I think engaging the apartment owners as well as the residents uh, in some good conversations, maybe at one site, maybe you get a, a, a you know a pilot site going around something like this to demonstrate you know the cost effectiveness for both parties involved in this. So it's a win-win for the renter and it's a win-win for for the owner. Uh, and most of all, it's a win-win for the planet. And that's that's the bottom line. Right. Yep. Yeah. Cole, Cole Davis is uh, looking at a. Um, something along the lines of like climate ready neighborhoods is a little more holistic approach to resiliency. And that seems like, you know, an idea that could fit nicely um, with that. So thank you, Peter. Sure. Hi, I, on that topic, I'm aware of two places in Davis where there is housing that's uh, providing uh, charging circuits. One is a um, co-housing that's across the street from Patman School. Um, and they think they were funded under that SACOG grant, probably. And then yeah. at the university retirement community, they have a charger there. And in their planned expansion, they're adding in EV units. Yeah. They just passed that at the, um, they, they proposed that. And it was passed at the um, planning commission uh, last week or two weeks ago, yeah. And then I have a separate question. Um, recently, I was notified by PG&E that I was being kicked off of the EVA rate schedule and forced onto EV2A. I don't know if anybody else is caught in that. Well, I'm not a PG&E rate right payer, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't own it, that problem. Well, I was under Valley Clean Energy, but nonetheless, it's... yeah. You know, process through PG and E. So okay. Hmm. So what's that all about? I'm curious that PG and E issue. I mean, what it? I don't understand why you were kicked off, or do you know why? Uh, it was uh, actually they've been kicked off a few plans. Uh, originally, I was in EV six, and I mean seven. I got kicked off and forced into EV seven. And then when we expanded the solar system to support charging a car, uh, again, we got changed in the different NEM code and, uh, and, uh, and the optimal at that point was the EVA. And uh, I think it's just, they're uh, only set up to give you benefits for a limited duration until they force you on uh, you know there's both good news and bad news in terms of of that move um, 
Um, I now have the low cost charging available from midnight to uh, 3 p.m., whereas mm -hmm. under the older plan, it was from 11, 11 p.m. at night until 7 in the morning. So it gives me more flexibility for, for charging uh, during the sunlight part of the day. Yeah, I've only been a um, EV owner for just barely a year as of next month. But um, so I'm not all that familiar with all these different rate plans that you are talking about. I only know a couple. Um, and the difference in the pricing, I mean, the difference in the charging at the lower rate, there were a few hours here and there, but I didn't know there were so many different ones. So every time they kicked you off, you were going to a higher cost plan for you. Is that right? Uh, typically, uh, a less solar benefit, uh, rate benefit, and, uh, and uh, you know, more money to PG&E, I think. Yeah. So yeah. if I have solar, I shouldn't be telling PG and E that I uh, that I want to go on an EV plan. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, it's <laughs> you don't. It, it, you pick the pro plan that gives you best rate for your solar uh, at the time, and then uh, they only guarantee it for a while, and they, you know, yeah. Move off. Uh all of pg and &E's rates are on their website and you can look them up and look at what the requirements are and what the you know benefits are etc um anytime you touch your solar system um to expand it or change it in pretty much any way they're going to kick you off whatever rate you were on and put you on the newest nem um and then sometimes based on the nem you're not going to be eligible for a certain EV rate schedule. Um, you know, I I, I don't want to I don't want to defend PG&E, um, even though I did work for them back in the eighties. But um, <laughs> it's they're 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 I mean they're not the only ones with confusing rate schedules. I think every utility in California has confusing rate schedules. Even smudge yeah, is, is, is hard utility. to figure out too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, you know, I mean, I I did transmission planning, which is unusual, uh, not unusual, but it, it, you even get exposed to rates there. And rate making is really difficult because there's so many restrictions on what you can do, how much you can charge a certain class. You can't cross subsidize classes. And then you want to make it fair, but you want to incentivize certain behaviors. And it's, it's like, it, it can be a nightmare trying to figure out how to best do the rates. And, and somebody always gets their aux cord. It's just the nature of the business so um, but 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 one thing i will say though is you know you can read those read those rate schedules yourself but you can also i think um the cpuc i think they have some kind of a customer rate payer um i know they have a division of rate payer advocates and i'm not sure if they actually help customers but there may be some someone at the puc that could help you uh, decipher the rates and make sure that you're on the proper schedule. Maybe I, I can't guarantee, I can't guarantee that that's the case, but you know, there's, there's, there's help out there for, for people. Well, I think you, we've identified another good topic to get some expertise to talk to us. I think it's great. Yeah. And we, we have had um, at SAC EV, we've had representatives from PG, actually Diva had someone from PG&E come out but she was talking about something, not rate schedules. I don't think she was talking about something else. But um, anyway, yeah, you can, you can you can even get someone from PG&E to come out and maybe help explain some of this stuff too. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Johans. So, does does anybody else um, try and charge during the day? when they have, when they're, if you have solar, well, I was told, for instance, don't bother to get any of the EV rates at all. If you have enough capacity, figure out how to set up your, and it may be worth taking a bus or something for those who work, you know, someplace, and just charge during the day while you're producing your own energy. So you're not selling it to PG and then PGE, and then they're, you're paying for it again when you go to charge your car at night, between 12 and three, I mean, you've just lost, you, you've sold them stuff at a discounted rate and they're selling it back to you for you to charge your car 
at an even greater rate. Now, yeah. Is everybody pra is that a practice that everybody here is doing if they have solar? Well, for, sorry for me, I don't because my rate is the same twenty four seven. So I charge whenever I feel like it. Um, but um, yeah, for I, I would think some people, if if you're home and you can do the charging, it, it makes sense to do it. Uh, to try to avoid the export because you get paid a pittance for your export and you get charged an arm and a leg for your import. So you want to try to balance it. Um, another thing you can do, although it's very expensive, is invest in battery storage um, because in that way it doesn't matter. You can let the solar charge the home battery and then when your car comes home at night, plug it in and charge it, you know, and you'd be, you'd be okay. There'd be a little bit of loss there in that round trip process, but and of course the cost of the battery. So, but, but yeah, I mean, if you're home and you can actually charge during the day to avoid export, that's by far the smartest thing to do. Yeah. That's what Robert and I do. We're on a um, time of day schedule from pg and &E, And um, we got a second set of solar panels uh, just with the notion that that's what we wanted to do. Thank you, Barbara. I want to add that uh, I've got four vehicles, and I do a combination of uh, depending upon what car needs to be charged and at what time. I have a, a Fiat 500e that has a small, smaller battery, and that one I charge as soon as it plugs in. I've got uh, multiple solar panels and a uh, and a battery backup, but my larger battery vehicles, I tend to go at, at night so that I don't drain the, uh, like late late morning, so to speak, so that I don't uh, put a strain on the, on the battery backup. Yeah. Well, then, that, and that's a good idea because, you know, each cycle of charge discharge on that battery backup reduces its life, right? So if you can avoid that, that's a good idea too. Yep. Brian, you've had, you've had your hand raised. Did you want to say something? Oh, your, your mic's muted. I don't know an EV at this moment, but uh, I was just wondering, how much does it cost to charge an EV um, for capacity in, in as an average? I mean, how how much how much uh, uh, electrical Electricity does it does it take up? I mean, absorb. I mean, in terms of dollar and cents, how much does it cost? Is that well? The the way I look at it, it is it's maybe not what you exactly asked, but I look at it at cents per mile. So uh, for me, where I get you know, and it, it varies because you know, different cars get different um, quote mileage, um, but my car um, it costs me about five cents a mile to drive it, the electricity to drive it. And that's because my electric rate's about 17 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so that's probably, SMUD's probably gonna be similar, maybe a little less. Um, pg e will probably be three times as much. Um, but it depends yes. on the rate that you charge at. Um, I mean, if you, want to, if you want to find out what it would cost to fill it up, all you have to do is take the battery pack size in kilowatt hours and uh, multiply that by the rate you're paying cents per kilowatt hour. And that's, and then maybe add 10% for losses and that'll give you your dollars that you're gonna spend to fill it up. Okay, um, I just wondered, uh, I was gonna wonder whether, you know, these batteries that you could buy from, for example, Tesla is uh, worthwhile to have if you're gonna have an EV. You mean like in home batteries and home, yes. in home energy storage? Power wall. Oh, okay. Power yeah. Wall. yeah. I mean, yeah, is it, it. You have to run the numbers yourself based on your situation, what your usage is. Uh, if you have solar, if you don't have solar, um, you know, arbitrage on batteries is typically not economic. The battery costs more than you save. 
Um, but if you do have solar and then you're getting penalized for the NEM export because you're the amount you get is so low and then you're charged a whole bunch at night to pull it back in, then it could potentially work out. But you really, you have to do the numbers yourself. You can't just say, well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's economic for this. It's, it's, um, you know, it's, I mean, if you have specific, um, so does that mean that if you have a power wall, you don't have to worry about NEM charges? Oh no, you still do. Yeah. Yeah. But because, be because, because if you, if you, let's say you have solar and you have a battery, but you fail to charge the battery during the day and your system exports out, well, you're only going to get paid that NEM rate. So you need to make sure that everything is coordinated in, in such a way that the battery charges uh, at its maximum rate up, you know, uh, up, you want to, you want to minimize export. In other words, you want to try to keep the import during the day at near zero mm -hmm. so that that way you're, it, or at least, or, or, or at an import, well, even import, you probably want to avoid because it's a high rate during the day. Right. So, so you want to, um, try to minimize that and and the software in the in the systems typically does that for you mm -hmm. um, but but that's what you want to do you want to minimize uh your use your import export during the day and if you need the extra energy to charge the battery up for the next day you, you buy that at night when it's cheaper yeah well i was just wondering uh, would it be feasible a good idea to buy a, a power wall i i currently do have solar uh -huh. system right now and i just yeah. wondered whether it's worthwhile to buy powerwall uh to uh if i ever decide to move towards ev it it could be but like i said you you almost have to do the do the math on you know how many miles you drive so how much energy you put into your ev mm -hmm. uh how much energy your house uses you know that depends on how big it is and how big your solar system is and so everybody's use case is going to be different so it's, it's no, and so unfortunately, there's no answer where I can say, yeah, buy a buy a power wall, or no, don't buy a power wall. It's it's it depends. Unless yeah. somebody else has a better answer, that's that's my answer. Well, well Nathan uh, put in chat that his model three is sixty kilowatt hours. Uh, he multiplied it by 0. 0.42 and included twenty percent loss, so he gets thirty dollars and twenty four cents per per. Uh, charge for full charge well could you could you say that say that once more please so yeah sure, sure thing so his his tesla model 3 is 60 kilowatt hours yeah he multiplies it by 0. 0.42 okay and then he includes 20 percent loss so it's 20 and then that loss. yeah 20 percent loss and so, then he gets 30 dollars and 24 cents um, for a, for a, a charge I, that that's what it costs for for Tesla three, yes, yeah, the Tesla which is, a, which is a very economic vehicle, very high mileage base okay. relatively, yeah. So, um, just a quick question though for Nathan, that forty two cents does that include the twenty percent loss, or do you have to do the twenty percent loss after you've done the sixty kilowatts times forty two? Um. No, I I include that's forty two isn't included in the loss. I just I just um basically times one point two to to be okay. over overly so, conservative. Okay, so sixty times point four two times one point two. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And yeah, twenty for, twenty percent. Yeah, twenty percent might be a little high, but it's yeah. reasonable. Yeah. Today, okay, so sixty kilowatts times point four two times one point two, right? Right, because that's for the the twenty percent losses. In other words, that's that's where the twenty percent loss comes from. Okay. Right, right, because because not all the energy that flows through your meter is actually going to be kilowatt hours into your battery. You're going to have losses in the circuits and then the inverter, et cetera, or uh, rectifier, I guess, in that case. Because it's it's not a superconductor. No. <laughs> Not yet. We're not quite there yet. Not not unless you figure out a way to cool it down to I don't know what it is minus two hundred and seventy something Kelvin. Yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you very much for the information. So about like thirty dollars per charge, and that would be up to what what uh, two hundred miles. That's not bad. No, it's not bad. It's yeah. um. I'll uh, Jerry. Before you go, uh, I'll say this. It's 
with anything in terms of like electrifying your life. Uh, um, this is a bit tangential, but it's really going to be based on your use case uh, most of the time. Uh, I'll say that in terms of like home electrification, uh, these types of appliances don't typically get cheaper. Um, in, in the case of like heat pumps, for example, um, they typically get more expensive. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's going to be the case 100% with things like in-home charging, in-home in batteries, uh, but it's something to keep in mind. Anyway, go, go ahead, Jerry. Okay, so um, I know a guy, his name is Brock Glassman, and he works for this company called ES Solar, and they do something like a Tesla Powerwall, but it's not a Tesla. There's a company in Germany called Sonnen, spelled S-O-N-N-E-N, and the batteries they make are the lithium iron phosphate. And if you know anything about battery chemistry, those are the ones that absolutely never will catch fire because of the phosphorus in them. Um, the early, um, I think, um, version one and version two of the Tesla Powerwall were the old nickel manganese cobalt cells, which do have a flammable electrolyte. Um, I haven't heard of any homes going up with, in uh, smoke, but there have been a number of car accidents where the batteries have actually caught fire. So these Sonnen batteries, um, they will not do that. And in terms of the life, um, they will actually last three times longer than the original um, Tesla Powerwall batteries in terms of the calendar life and also the number of charge cycles. So it's a longer lasting battery. It's a more robust battery. It won't catch fire. And the company offers two plans. One is you buy it up front, which is prohibitive for all of us people. And then they have another plan where they own the batteries and there's some sort of a deal they have with PG&E. They're actually what they call a purchase power agreement. So PG&E will use the um, energy in the battery on demand when they need it to balance the grid, you know, in terms of keeping the 60 hertz at 60 hertz instead of 59.8 or something like that. So they will actually pay a customer um, a certain amount to use their batteries temporarily for a few seconds, a few times a day, if it's one of those kids cases where it's a lot of air conditioning going on in the hot sun and so forth. So um, it's an advantage to the um, owner. And what happens is they will give you the batteries, install the batteries. And if you don't have solar, they'll install that as well. And you pay nothing up front. What they do is they will guarantee you that you will actually be paying less out of your pocket each month compared to what you previously paid with PG&E. So let's say your PG&E bill was $400 a month. With this thing, you might be paying something like $289 a month. And so you're basically renting the batteries for a certain period of time, and you're getting the lower energy costs, and you get a little bit of income from the PG&E purchase power agreement, and they have a deal with Zonin. So the PG&E really likes the Zonin batteries. So if you want, I can put in the chat the name of the guy that um, is located in Rockland. He actually came down here to Los Altos for a show that we had last week in the rain. And he had a booth there with information. And he was pretty little busy talking all day long to the people saying that, hey, you can save money on your PG&E bill and avoid all these um, rate increases and uh, have a battery backup at the same time. So if PG&E goes down, which they're known to do for sometimes days at a time, the battery backup will power your house for at least three days, depending on how much power you use. So they will actually install up to eight circuit breakers in your panel that will run off of the batteries and it seamlessly switches. Whenever the power goes away for more than a few milliseconds, it'll switch to the batteries automatically. You don't have to do anything. It's all done with the software. So they're pretty cool setup. So I can put the guy's uh, email in the, in the chat and you guys can check it out if you want and tell them I sent you. Yeah. One, okay. Well, sure. Thanks. Yeah. One thing I would add, though, is that well, it's actually a, a bonus. Is that with the LFP batteries, you can charge them from zero to one hundred percent all the time. It's not like NMC where you have to basically try to keep it in between twenty and eighty percent. Um, and so, and they'll last a lot longer. I think you may have mentioned that already, but yeah. So. so yeah. And the other thing I, I forgot to mention is I did mention that, you know, they own the batteries and you kind of rent the, the system from them for less than what your PG&E would have been by a significant amount, sometimes 30% or so. But in addition, after a certain number of years, I can't remember if it's 12 years or 15 years, but after a certain amount of time, the amount of money that, uh, you know, you've been renting the power from them 
will actually pay for their investment and then you own it. So they give it to you after a while. So it's kind of a rent to own sort of a deal. I actually pulled up the uh, website and they have a little video here on their Sony Core Plus home battery. If, ah, cool. Yeah, so I think it's a, it's like a three minute video. So maybe we'll give it a watch and actually see what it's about. Cool. I'll, I'll put the guys the email in the chat as well. Um, I'll, I'll send it there in a second here. I got to look it up on my other computer. Yeah, sure thing. We're, we're, we're going to watch this short video. Yeah. Oh, cool. Talk about it. What if there was a smart, safe, and easy way to power the most important items in your home with clean energy that you produce? With this, and this, and also protect this. Introducing Sonin Core Plus, the newest home battery from the energy experts at Sonin. It's a safe, long-lasting and sustainable way to power your life with nature's preferred reliable clean energy. Let's take a look at a day in the life with Sonin. Sonin is part of your home. It's hassle-free, working behind the scenes day and night to seamlessly and safely manage your home's energy use. Sonin Core Plus helps care for your family and the planet by using the cleanest energy available to reliably power your life as it happens. In the morning, the Sonin battery goes to work, intelligently balancing energy generated by your rooftop solar and the utility grid to power your morning routine. It also stores excess clean energy from the sun when it's plentiful for use later in the day. The MySonin app shows you how the Sonin is working, so you can watch your energy use anytime, anywhere. Sonin seamlessly powers your everyday life as you live it, giving you greater peace of mind with no extra work. It's built for safety and longevity and is designed to protect your home, your family, and the environment. In the afternoon, the Sonin battery maximizes your solar, powering key loads and storing excess sunlight to use late in the day when power from the grid is expensive. It even helps you qualify for special programs that give you rebates and rewards for using clean energy. In the evening, as you and your family wind down, Sonin powers appliances like your electric stove, washer, and fridge with stored sunlight automatically recharging from the grid when it's cheaper, cleaner, and more plentiful. So you can relax knowing that the energy that powers the moments that make your life better also helps reduce CO2 emissions to better the planet. Sonin even works overnight, powering key appliances like your washer and fridge using stored sunlight and recharging with excess cleaner energy from the grid. It's an innovative and intelligent way to store and manage energy so that nothing is wasted as you go about your day. And it has the potential to save you money. The Sonin Home Battery protects your home from power outages, giving you the ultimate peace of mind. With the touch of a button, you can fully charge the battery before a big storm or a planned power outage hits your area. When the power does go out, the Sonin automatically flips into backup mode, giving you instant, reliable power. Sonin also keeps your solar system working during extended outages, allowing you to power your essentials using the sun until the grid comes back online. Your Sonin battery can become part of a clean energy community, supporting the transition to a sustainable energy future for not only your home, but also your neighbors, your community, and eventually the world. Sonin Core Plus prepares you for the unexpected by safely, seamlessly, and securely managing your home's energy day and night. A safe, clean, reliable, and sustainable energy future is here with Sonin. So yeah, I'll put. Well, thanks for showing that video. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I'll put that link in the chat for the person who asked for it. Rich. Um, yeah, and any thoughts? This team's kind of similar 
to some of the smart panels. Oh, and uh, this is their their uh, residential page if you were interested. Well, you can. Yeah, all one of the things. One of the things they'll do is they'll actually come out to your house and um, they use a drone to take a picture of your roof to see where the best place is to put the solar panels and, you know, how many you need and so forth. And you, you give them a, a couple of uh, PG&E bills for them to look at and they can give you an estimate of what they'll rent you the power for at a lower rate. Oh, okay. So they do some calculation for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's, in fact, that's um, pretty standard, though, Jerry. Right? What's that? That's pretty standard for the, the, the two contractors that we've uh, spoken with. They, they they all do that. But you're right. Yeah. That's that's a, that's a really uh, we try to. I mean, we're consultants ourselves. So we try and get their their expertise as as much as possible. Yeah, so uh, the guy that's the vice president of our chapter, the Electric Vehicle Association, he has some really old panels that only do like 200 watts per panel. And so they did an estimate for him saying, well, remove all of your old panels and put 400 watt panels there and add the batteries. So, you know, for him, not only it was, you know, adding the batteries, but they, they gave him twice of the, you know, power out of each solar uh, cell. We'll see. Sounds good. Thanks for bringing that this that whole story, uh, Jerry. That's good stuff. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Okay, well, we have just over 20 minutes left in our meeting today. Um, is it? Um, for, for now, is there any other items or announcements that or questions that anyone had for now? Well, I do have an announcement um, if uh, if it's okay. Um, let's see. I think I think this is the one. Um, we have um, there's a number of other Earth Month events that are going on. Um, there's another one on April 20th, but I won't mention it because I don't want to take away from picnic day. Um, but there is there is an ECOS event on the 21st at Southside Park in Sacramento. There's another event on the same day in Nevada City, if anybody wants to drive up there. Um, there is an event this next this coming Saturday. Um, it's uh, EVs at, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but Dia de la Tierra, I think. Um, it's in, um, uh, uh, where is it? Um, I, oh, shoot, it's not listed here. But anyway, I can send information to anybody that's interested um, in these events. There's also a couple of events, uh, SMUDs having their solar car races. Um, at uh, Consumerist Rivers River College for the middle school. That's on Monday the 22nd, and then on the 24th, they're having the high school event at the um, at uh, Cal uh, CSUS. And then um, on the 27th, there's gonna be an event in Roseville. Um, and so we're all, we're all gonna be there. Um, those events at different. We're just looking for additional volunteers. So if anybody's interested, um, let me know um, or put your, you know, just put your email in the chat or I'll put my email in the chat. How's that? And then if you're, if you're interested in any of those events, just let me know. Um, let's see. What is my... It's pretty So, yep, so that's all I have. Thanks, Peter. Sure. Yeah, that's, uh, well, it's, it's at Gmail, right? Did I, did I type that wrong? Yes, I did. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. It is. It's, let me, no worries. Let me fix it. <laughs> I'm going to get a bunch of bounce backs. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully people realize that there's got to be an at sign in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Oh, what? No, oh, man.
okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, nobody ever said I knew how to type. No. <laughs> All right. Oh, I know why I did that, why that happened. Okay, there. Nope, wait a minute. What's going on here? There. There we go. I think I got it right this time. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we have exactly 20 minutes left in our meeting today. I was thinking, um, well, actually, I'll, first I'll say that uh, we had the, um, we were fortunate enough to have the Cybertruck at our last um, farmer's market tabling event. Um, it was a uh, pretty busy farmer's market, so it was a, it was a great day for um, outreach. Um, and naturally the truck attracted a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. Uh, on, on both sides, of course. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen, or maybe you haven't, um, seen Tesla's uh, Cybertruck. If you if you you're aware of it. Oh yeah, I've um, seen it. Yeah, it's it's a it's a vehicle that is supposedly uh, rushed through production, and um, people are having to send them back to get repairs. Um, things like maybe the the driver door latch isn't quite fastened as much as it could be, so there's more of a gap between the the rear door and the front door that gradually widens, so they just have to go back and tighten it. Um, that anyway, so that, that's typical Tesla when they release something new. It's, it takes a while for them to get the bugs out of it. That was like they had a contract with Boeing. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I don't I don't know that the, the Cybertruck door ever fell off, but it just didn't fit very well. <laughs> yeah, we um we wanted to have the uh we wanted to have the Cybertruck for one of the vehicles for the Pig Day parade, but it's looking like uh it's being sent back just to get the that door issue fixed. Mm -hmm. So no, nothing too major, but you know it's always interesting to hear. Um, so anyway, there is a certain uh, YouTuber that I enjoy watching his content on electric vehicles. So I think to close out this meeting, I think that it's about a 20 minute video, if you all don't mind watching about him, his experience living with the Cybertruck uh, something that everyone was interested in or wouldn't mind wouldn't mind viewing. Yeah? All right. Let me let me get that pulled up. And it's a bit longer than we have time for, so uh I'll we'll end a few minutes early. We'll 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 on the video before we finish out. We'll have, we'll we'll talk a bit about it. All right, thanks. I'll have to check out now, though. So, see you guys next time. All right, Zachary. Thanks, thanks for joining. Past couple of weeks, months, years, decades. Uh, but this one might be the weirdest one of them all. And I don't think it's particularly close. This, this thing here, this has come out for 2024 and it's called the Tesla Cybertruck. I've been driving it, living with it for almost a thousand miles for a couple of weeks now, so you don't have to. God, it's, I will say this vehicle is characterized by these really big highs and lows, really big sweeping, exciting, really interesting things about it. And then lows on the other side that are like really disappointing about it that you only really find by actually living with it, which I have been. So that's what this video is. I'm just gonna detail everything, break it down, Try not to get hurt by them. They tend to interrupt these videos, but that's okay. This is the Cybertruck. Now there's really, it feels like there's only one place to start with the truck, which is how it looks, right? This thing, I have a lot more to say about it and maybe a, a main channel full review, but I think it's kind of iconic. Meaning you either love this or you hate it. And in person, it looks even more cyberpunk, like low poly render than maybe anything on video quite shows. And I'll dig more into the, the materials and the build quality and panel gaps in just a second, but there's something you should know about living with a Cybertruck, 
which is that the truck itself is a bit of a celebrity. At least at this moment, especially if you're in a place where there aren't really any others yet, you cannot drive this without getting attention at all. It's the most attention-getting vehicle by a long, long way that I've ever gotten. You drive this thing, people walking past turn around, they, people driving by literally accelerate to try to get a better video out their side window of you driving by. It's actually kind of dangerous. Like the way that people behave on the road when they see a Cybertruck and want to go get a video of it is crazy. That's all by itself. This truck also has sentry mode. You probably already know about Tesla's where you walk up to the truck and it knows and it turns on the recording from the cameras. This truck has hundreds of video clips of people walking up to it and looking inside and just generally interrupting it and draining the battery during the day. It's that popular. So <laughs> I feel like it's polarizing enough that people either love it or hate it. In real life, I kind of like it. It's really hard to explain why. I think it looks sick in person. Um, it's also dirty. Don't get me started. The roads in New Jersey suck. They're flying away. It's okay. Um, but generally, yeah, this is a, uh, it's a very unique looking truck. But the thing about these looks is I think it actually distracts people from a lot of really interesting technical innovation that goes on under the hood. I mean, everyone wants to talk about the looks, understandably, but the 800 volt architecture, this crazy suspension with a ton of travel, like there's more happening with this truck that I'll get into in a second. But let's just start with the basics. What is it, right? There's basically two Cybertruck specs you can get right now, two different versions, the dual motor or the triple motor, the Cyberbeast. So this is the Foundation Edition Cybertruck Foundation Series, which means it's one of the first ones. It's a low VIN number, but this is the dual motor version. The triple motor version is basically the exact same truck, but faster because it has an extra motor in the back and it has Alcantara in the dash. That's basically the only difference. But let's get into the technical stuff. First of all, they ship to owners without that hub cap. Remember the aero cap that we see in all those early cyber trucks, especially when they show all that promo material? That's not on this truck. So you do have just the open wheel when you get your cyber truck. They're redesigning the aero cover that you'll eventually allegedly get, uh, which means this. You see the open wheel, you see the brakes, but you also just have like no hub caps and no nut covers. And that's the only place I've seen rust on this truck. A little bit worrying, but that's the way it is right now. You can get third-party covers if you want, but that's the place I see rust on this truck. And then the thing about a low VIN Tesla is you will be dealing with low VIN production quality stuff. Only reason I say that is because I'm the guy who doesn't really care about panel gaps too much and I still really don't pay too much attention to it. But this panel gap is actually worth mentioning. It's the worst I've ever seen in a production vehicle. I'll just show it to you. This is the driver's side door. There's no door handles, as you can tell. The way to get into the truck is that little handle, and it pushes it out, and then you pull the truck out the rest of the way. That's why there's fingerprints all over this truck. But, I don't know. I think there's going to be something wrong with this door, because it literally looks like it's open. Like, that, that's pretty bad. I've never seen a gap quite that bad. That's the way it should look. That's the way it looks. It's probably one of those things where I'll have to bring it into Tesla. They'll tighten some things up and it'll look fine. But that's the stuff you will probably have to deal with if you get a low VIN Cybertruck. But then, of course, you know, you're looking at the materials, you're looking at these angles, all the sharpness up here. We've covered that. I've talked about this before. This is not a surprise. But you have this big LED light bar on the front, which is pretty iconic when it pulls up behind you. And then all of the actual headlights are down here. And so that's where all the actual bright light comes from. You also got your front facing camera on a Tesla for the first time with a washer, sick. And then this huge sloping windshield, some might even call it the largest sloping windshield on any vehicle ever, which brings us to the windshield wiper. This is the largest windshield wiper on any production car. And you've seen people do this before, but it's just massive. It's just big blade. It's pretty expensive to uh, replace, but it seems to work fine. The one weird thing about it is it doesn't actually go all the way down to the bottom of the glass on the windshield. This actually pivots over to a couple inches above the bottom. So when it's wiping, there's just a bunch of rain and water at the bottom that still continues to roll up the windshield even while you've cleared the windshield. It's kind of a 
weird California quirk where they design cars that aren't as good in rain as you would expect. Either way. To build the Honda CRV hybrid, we took everything you love about the CRV and kicked it up. Either way, I'll just finish my way around the outside of the truck. It's a pretty big truck, as you already know. It's full size, especially from like this rear three quarter angle. It just has these big shoulders. It kind of looks like a dump truck in a way. Maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but that's that's what it reminds me of. Uh, either way, big glass sunroof, and then you've got this huge truck bed, which has the lockable tonneau cover, which they call a vault. And when that comes up, it closes that rear window and comes all the way back to the front. And then you can open the tailgate. So there's lights in the tailgate. There's even hidden storage right here. There's no room for a spare. So this is a truck where if you want to carry a spare, that's going to take up room in the actual truck. But, you know, you can have your charging equipment down here, maybe have some groceries down here, a little sub trunk space, never hurt anybody. And I definitely want to mention you have these outlets over here. So you have the two 120s, but you also have a 240 volt, which you can literally use to charge other vehicles. You can charge another Tesla, you can charge a Rivian, whatever, just with the mobile connector by plugging it in here and plugging it into the other vehicle, which is pretty sweet. But this is also a good time to talk about the battery of the Cybertruck. It's a big battery physically, but it's not the best range I've ever seen. So this dual motor Cybertruck is going to get on a full 100% charge up to like 320 miles indicated. You can actually drive more like 290. And the triple motor, which I've been recently living with, maxes out at 300 indicated, which is actually more like 265, 275. And it's also not the fastest charging Tesla we've seen either. You go to a regular Tesla supercharger and you don't max out at quite the same charge curve speeds for a long time as like a Model 3 or a Model S would. So it's really not the ideal long-term road tripper. That said, there are several accessories that are supposed to be also coming to the Cybertruck. And this is one of those low points of the Cybertruck, which is it's so early that they don't exist yet and I don't know when they will. But one of them is the extended battery that goes on the back of this thing that brings it up to allegedly 500 miles. Huge, several thousand pounds, plugs into the truck, takes up space in the truck bed. I don't know if or when that's coming, but it exists on their website. The other is the light bar on the top. It's also who knows when it's coming. There's no info about it. I saw one at Tesla's factory, but no indication of when that's going to come, even though I ordered one and I have a truck that doesn't have it. So the last thing that's not shipping with the Cybertruck yet is autopilot. So it has all these sensors. It has all these cameras all the way around the truck. But the autopilot or full self-driving that you're used to in other Model S and Model 3 and Model Y and Model X doesn't work. All that this has is traffic wear cruise control. So you still steer, but it will do following the car in front of you and keeping its distance variable speed. That's it. You paid for autopilot. You don't get it. You paid for that battery. Doesn't exist yet. You paid for the light on top. It's not there. But let me show you what is here because I have noticed some new stuff. And by the way, I said this in the impressions video. I said that this would happen. And here are all your fingerprints from getting into the Cybertruck. But let's look at the interior real quick. This is your steering wheel. So the Cybertruck is in every... That sounds bad. Uh, the Cybertruck is in every possible way a Tesla on the inside. It's very, very minimal. And to me, maybe even too minimal, just because this is supposed to feel a little bit more of a special vehicle. Here you go. First of all, this is the key. It's just the normal key fob. But this is the first Tesla ever with a power opening front trunk. It would be nice to have a button to open it or just kind of like a cool cyber fob. But cost. Got to save cost. Same thing here. It's everything on one screen. And to give them credit... It's an awesome screen. It's a huge display. I think it's 15 inches diagonally. It's got all this compute. It's really smooth. Everything you ask it to do, it usually does it pretty dang smoothly. So even though there is no CarPlay, there is no Android Auto, this is the best computer I've ever used in a car. All the UI, pretty intuitive. I think some people find this menu a little bit intimidating because there's a lot visually going on here. But once you get used to it, you kind of know by muscle memory where to get to things. I just wish there was climate control buttons like I always do in a car. You have to go into the menus here and then sort of move this stuff around. This is all this is all very Tesla, right? But you've got this storage space in the middle. You've got two wireless chargers that work great. 
two cup holders, and then storage in the center here. And that actually goes down even further. And then some pretty comfortable seats, I'd say. They're heated and ventilated. But I think what you really care about from the driver's seat is the steering. So one of the highs of the Cybertruck is it has this incredible steering, which is enabled by basically three main things. A combination of the things. One, steer by wire. Two, a variable steering ratio. And three, rear wheel steering. Okay, so all of these things put together make this the most nimble feeling truck, especially at low speeds, I think ever made. Okay, so this is the steering wheel or squircle you're dealing with. It's kind of small, but it does have your blinker buttons that are physical buttons that actually click instead of just haptics. You've got your uh, headlights there, a real horn, thankfully, uh, and your autopilot button, which again, just does adaptive cruise control and your, Jesus, your giant windshield wiper right there and voice controls. Okay, so we know what this looks like. First thing that's crazy about this is this is full lock. It's not this like hand over hand over hand thing to get the truck to fully steer. That is turning all the way right and that is turning all the way left. So this is the most one handable driving vehicle probably ever of this size. And then the variable steering ratio, all that really means is at low speeds, it's turning the wheel. Ugh, steer by wire is this crazy thing. It sounds insane because the wheels okay, are I'm gonna send you the, the, to the actual wheels and tires. It's all just a computer and I think it might so. as well be a computer controller. But what it's yeah. actually doing on top of all that is it's changing the amount that it's steering based on how fast you're going. So at low speeds, Hello. it's really quick and nimble. Like and at high this speeds, it's yeah. a little bit, and it's not quite so bad. Um, you you see, like, have, and like I said, the last component uh, is the rear wheels turn oh, more than today. any other vehicle again and, uh, I've ever tried. Uh, right now. Is, uh, We're going to end that video there, but... You Did you just try unplugging the phone and plugging it back in again? Jerry, yeah, you're, you're unmuted. What about the one in the bedroom? Uh, is that there too? And uh, no, no luck, huh? No luck, yeah. Can, hey, Jerry, you are unmuted. Else. Brandon, can you mute, can you mute Jerry since you're the host? Yeah. And... Thanks for that. All right, so... Yeah, that was a little, little look at the Cybertruck. Um, I thought the most interesting thing was the uh, turning system and how basically you can make a vehicle that big, um, that agile. So, but yeah, we're going to end here pretty quickly. Um, any, anyone have any thoughts or anything they, they wanted to say? Um, that doesn't have to be about the video. <laughs> oh, well. Um, thank you all for coming this week or this month. And uh, next month we will be planning on doing an in-person event. Um, if you know any venues, um, any neighborhoods, please shoot me an email. But yeah, besides that, um, I'll see you all. Hopefully, I'll see you all hopefully um, at, at, at the next Diva meeting. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks for your work, Brandon. Yeah, thank, thanks, everyone.